Hi, everybody. I'm Allie Cooks, and I'm the data quality trainer for the Department of Education data team. And today we are talking about the October 1 enrollment report. Uh, this is your EPS funding report. So let's dive in. A uh, quick overview, October 1 enrollment collects student counts age 4 to 21 years old for EPS funding, essential programs and services. Uh, we're looking at economically disadvantaged counts, special education, multilingual learner, attending students, and out-of-district placement students. So these will all be encompassed. Um, we'll, we're going to talk about attending counts versus subsidy counts, all of that as we go through today's webinar. There are quite a few resources that are available for this report to make it complete, as there are a lot of elements that are included in it. So just please be aware of that, that this is um, an all-encompassing report that you do want to make sure you have as robust of an understanding as possible. Quite a few of the resources on our student data entry and reporting page are going to be very useful for you. So uh, from the MEDEM support page, the student data entry and reporting page looks like to the left here. Uh, you can select the button at the bottom and then you'll come up with the Synergy uploads. In order to get into this in this report, all students have to be entered into Synergy. So those upload guides can be really helpful there. Uh, student enrollment guides, we're going to go through a couple of them today to just talk about some of the data elements. But enrollment guidance, the enrollment guidance document will be very helpful in helping you with some of those one-off situations for enrollment. Uh, that, again, is still on the student data entry page under student enrollment guides, enrollment guidance. So that can be used. There are, I don't know how many exactly, but there are quite a few scenarios there uh, that you can consult uh, for enrollment situations. Fiscal responsibility codes are also outlined under the student enrollment guides that will go through all the different fiscal responsibilities and what they are looking for in terms of resident town code, um, attending a charter school, things like that. We'll also talk about those today. Also available is information about home instruction, homelessness as well, um, and how to enroll students who are experiencing homelessness um, for funding purposes. Multilingual learner identification is also listed on that page. And then under student reports, the instructions for how to access this page uh, or access this report in NEO are under October 1st student enrollment counts. And then the special education student counts EFS 05 part one is the first part of this October 1 student enrollment count report, which is certified by your special education director. Um, they'll have to certify first. So there are also instructions there of how to access that report for them. So those that would be information to pass along to your superintendent for certification as well as your uh, special education director for certification of that first part before the superintendent can do theirs. The reporting dates for this report, it's only looking at 10-1-2024, so it's only looking at that one specific day. Uh, enrollments do need to cover over that day in order to be counted. We'll get into that in a moment, but it is just looking at that day. The report will open on 10-1, and will remain open until 1015. That is not a certification period. That is a review period. That was those first two weeks of October are for you to go in. The report will be running. It will be creating aggregate counts. You'll be able to see what's in your synergy so you can modify any data, do any validation of the data. Using that two weeks for validation is going to be really key because as soon as 1016 happens, that's when certification is going to open. So once certification is open, other SAUs that your students are attending out of district may start certifying the report, uh, their own reports. So you want to make sure that as much as it is in there as possible by the 16th. So I would try to aim for that. The final certification of this report is due on 1030. So uh, the first two weeks of, of October are your review period. You cannot certify the button. The, report. That button will not be available. We did have some questions about that last year, so I just want to be very clear that this report cannot be certified until after 10-15, so starting on 10-16, um, and then certification is due on the 30th. This one works a little bit different than most of the other reports that we do. All of the data is going to flow from your local student information system. You will either have to do manual data entry into Synergy or run a report from your local student information system and upload it into State Synergy. Uh, we're only looking at active 
student enrollments for this current school year. Also exited last year. Uh, we did a webinar earlier in like August about enrolling your students that is available on the main state SIS training website uh, or playlist for YouTube. If you need access to that, please reach out to medems.support at main.gov. We can send you that link. Uh, but all students need to be re-enrolled in Synergy. So if you've done it already this year, you're good. Uh, but if you haven't done it in the 24-25 school year, they do need to be entered prior to this report. Uh, once the data has been entered into state Synergy, you will see it reflected in the NEO reports in student data. This report is only looking at those 10-1 dates. So if you have an enrollment like this first enrollment that we see here that opened on 9-5 as the first day of school and was open, it remains open, no exit date entered um, until after like the future, uh, that enrollment will overlap 10-1. It will count for EPS reporting. The second option or the section, the second um, enrollment here, 95 to 929, that student would not count on a report for EPS funding because it's not overlapping that 10 1 date. The same is true for the third enrollment that we see here. That's a 10 2 date. So that's after the 10 1 date. That's it's really only looking at that one specific day, that October 1st. Um, so that where 10 2 is after, you're not going to see them on the report either. Uh, but if you do have a start date of 10-1, October 1, uh, like this last example, they will count on your report. If the exit date is also 10-1, they'll be counted on the report. So it's, a, it's looking at just those enrollments that are on 10-1. Anyone who transferred out, you would see them on your attending student details report, but you're not going to see them on this October 1 report. Um, so just please be aware of that, that we're only looking at those specific day, that specific day. Uh, for enrollment purposes. 10-1 is a Tuesday this year, so we don't have to worry about that weekend stuff anymore. The student enrollment guidance document, as I mentioned before, this is going to list a lot of the scenarios. I know this is really hard to see, um, but the point is not to really see it, but to just understand that this is, exists as a resource on the student data entry and reporting page under student enrollment guides. Um, so this is going to list kind of the situation to the far left. Uh, so uh, the first one I think says student attending public school in an, uh, the resident SAU. It will tell you who gets the primary enrollment, who would get a partial enrollment if necessary. Not every one of them gets a partial enrollment. Um, who the resident town and SAU should be, fiscal responsibility, responsible SAU, EFSO5 count. Uh, ex, uh, accountability, state assessment, all of the all of that information will be listed right here. Um, so it's going to give you quite a bit of information about how you could enroll your students, what codes to use in certain situations. Um, do kind of read it carefully just to make sure that you're looking at the right situation for the student that you're working with. Um, if you need help with interpreting interpreting this data, or you feel like there's kind of um, a situation that's a little bit off. From what you're seeing in this document, please feel free to reach out to medems.support at main.gov um, and we can help you with that or point you in the right direction to get the assistance that you need. Again, this is only a small portion. There are many of these. Uh, this whole document is available on student data reporting and uh, entry and reporting under medems support. Fiscal responsibility codes. Again, this is just a small section. This is the first page of a PDF that's available when you select the fiscal responsibility guide off of the student enrollment guides on student data entry and reporting. But it's going to give you the descriptions of all of the fiscal responsibility codes and when they should be used, when they should not be used, things like that. Um, so just be aware of that as well. Fiscal responsibility codes and resident town codes do need to reconcile with one another. Um, so particularly, particularly for code R, which is resident of school unit, uh, those students need to be marked as, with a resident town that is inside of your school administrative unit. If you're using code O, which is paid by resident SAU or EUT, those students need to be outside of the school administrative unit, so that resident code has to be a town that is not included in the SAU that is reporting. 
Superintendent's agreements are very similar to a code O. A superintendent agreement does have to be in place if you're using that code with one exception. Um, and the resident of town has to be outside of the SAU for superintendent agreements. Uh, there is also a charter school code. Charter schools, uh, all main charter schools are supposed to use this code. I wanted to mention here that the exception to this is that if students are residents of EUT, they need to be marked with a code O. So they would be a paid by resident SAU or EUT, not a charter fiscal responsibility. So please be aware of that for my charter schools that may be in the audience. Code C is your primary code, but for any students residing in EUT, you're going to use that code O. These are all available on the enrollment guides document. Um, all the descriptions are available there. Um, these are also listed uh, in this format on the enrollment upload guide, the data dictionary. If you have students who are experiencing homelessness, um, fiscal responsibility is really important to pay attention to for those students. Um, students experiencing homelessness have the right to reside outside of their SAU while attending the SAU of origin. If a student is experiencing homelessness and they are residing outside of your SAU, you have a couple different ways that you can code them. Uh, you can code them as a resident of the district with a town, in, but again, those codes have to reconcile with the resident town code. So they have to be living, they have to be a resident code inside the SAU with a resident code of inside the SAU, so R. Um, that's one option. O, you can use and put them in their um, resident town code residing outside of where the student is, like where the student is actually living. Um, and then you would just want to make sure that you're talking with the other SAU so they know that they're getting the funding for that student and that you're expecting um, a tuition payment for that student. So just be aware of that with code O, you do need to collaborate with the other SAU to make sure that the funding gets worked out because uh, you will not receive the funding in your ED-279 if you're using code O. The resident SAU that you entered will receive that funding and you'll have to make sure that there's an agreement of how that uh, the funds will be distributed. With the code S, you can also use that in this instance. You do not need a formal student, uh, a formal superintendent agreement for students experiencing homelessness. Um, so that would be a resident code where the student is actually living, superintendent agreement, fiscal responsibility, and you would receive the funding for educating that student. Um, so you, and in this instance for code S for homelessness, you do not need a formal superintendent's agreement for them. We typically recommend, I believe, code R or code S. Um, if you have a good working relationship with the other SAU, you can use code O. Home instruction and uh, so home instruction is uh, just a flag. Uh, so it's for students who are receiving partial education in their SAU. So if a student is there for one class a day with the rest of their, um, you know, fourth grade class, then that they would have a partial FTE, full-time equivalency, for whatever amount of time that they're spending in the school. Those are in 25% um, increments. And all of your students, all of your students are going to be FTE zero if they're full-time, but if they're um, partially enrolled in um, homeschool, then you would have these one, two, three, or four based on the amount of time they're spending in the school. So this is only for students with partial enrollments. The home instruction flag is only for those partial enrollments. Um, students who are receiving home instruction but attending part of the day. So if you have a student who is not enrolled in school at all, but they are receiving home instruction, uh, they filled out everything in the home instruction um, module in NEO, everything's all set, they do not get an enrollment in Synergy. Um, so they need to be exited from your Synergy with a transferred to home instruction code if they are fully in, invo involved with home instruction. If they're receiving partial instruction, that's where this flag comes into place and where you would use these FTE codes. 
FTE5 is used for very specific scenarios, and these are the only three that they qualify for. If a student is receiving special education services from the resident SAU while attending private school, you would use an FTE5 for this student. So that is they're receiving only special education from the resident SAU while attending a private school, FTE5. For an expelled student, receiving special education services only. So if they're receiving only special education services and they have been expelled, they, they still have a right um, to those special education services as an expelled student, that's an FTE5. The other instance is a student who has graduated and returns for only special education services. So they're not enrolled in other general education courses, but they are receiving special education services after graduation. They need an FTE5. These are the only instances where a student would be receiving, would be flagged with a mark with a FTE5. All right, let's talk about economic status. So economic status for EPS reporting. Uh, this is different. I want to be very clear. There is a difference between economic status reporting for EPS and economic status reporting for free and reduced meals. There is a very big dis distinction between the two of them. So economically disadvantaged students are students who are eligible for free and reduced meal status. Um, so we only are looking, since this is state statute, we're looking for eligibility for free and reduced meal. EPS reporting is required for, it requires an annual collection of economic status data. There are CEP and um, special provision programs that do uh, restrict the ability for collecting economic status information through meal programs. So I just wanna make sure everyone is aware of that. You should work with your nutrition director. We did a webinar about this a few weeks ago, but work with your nutrition director to understand which provision you may be in, or if you're not in a, in a pro uh, provision, but a traditional meal program. These are the things that you should do if you are in any of these situations. And this document is also um, available on the student data entry and reporting page under enrollment guides. Um, there's a section for economic status. So there's a whole section for economic status available there um, that has this information, as well as some, some more information about students who are identified for economic status. So if you're a part of a traditional meal operation, you should collect your free and reduced meal applications for feeding your students. So that would be for school nutrition. And then you can also use those forms for EPS reporting, what we're talking about today. You can also collect the economic, the alternate economic status form to supplement for EPS reporting, but those alternate economic status forms cannot be used to feed your students. They can only be used to mark for economic disadvantage in the EPS report. So that would go directly into Synergy. It should never be seen by your nutrition director. If you're in a special provision two base year, which means that you're collecting the alternate economic status forms, it's gonna be the same as your traditional meal operations. You should collect both so that your alternate economic status forms can supplement your free and reduced meal forms. The alternate economic status form can be a little bit less invasive for families. And so it might feel a little bit better for them to fill that out as opposed to the free and reduced meal form. But the free and reduced meal form, again, remember, does not feed your students. It should never go to your nutrition director. And it cannot be used for Title I. So it is only for EPS. If you are in a special provision two or a community eligibility provision, those two, so in the non-base year for special provision two or community eligible, eligibility provisions, you are not allowed to collect the free and reduced meal forms. However, you'd still need that annual collection of um, economic eligibility for EPS reporting. So you should send out those alternate economic status forms if you have not already, and you should try to get as many of those back as you can so that you can get that information into Synergy so that you can flag those students correctly. Um, there's a lot of funding tied to economic status, so sending out that alternate form can really be of help. Okay, 
So that's the data elements. Now we're going to get into where this report is located in NEO. So if you, uh, this is going to be in the student data section or the student data module of NEO. And if you do not have access to the student reports in NEO, you will need to have your superintendent submit a NEO access request form on your behalf uh, to the MEDEM support team so that they can get that processed. If you are new to your SAU and you do not have an active staff assignment, that is something that will need to be entered into NEO staff prior to the uh, processing of that access request. So you'll need to contact whoever it is with NEO staff access. They'll have to activate your, um, your staff assignment in NEO staff, and then we can process your access request. But let me go back to where I was. Uh, NEO, in NEO, we're going to go to student data, student reports, and then the October 1st student enrollment report. Here's what that looks like. So we are under student data. And then we go to student reports. And then uh, it's going to be in alphabetical order, so you'll have to scroll down to October 1st enrollment. Once you are here, you will have your SAU name. If you have multiple SAUs that you're working with, you'll have to select the one that you want to see. And then you will select the uh, current school year, which is 2024-2025. Um, so this will be due on the 30th. I want to be very clear. This date that you're seeing here is incorrect. Um, so it is the 30th that this report is due. Um, I didn't catch that before right now. Just want to make sure we are clear on that. Um, once you're here, you can select this view report option to link you into all of the reports that make up this October 1st student enrollment report. And that is where you will see this section. Oh, apparently Ooh, we'll extra time. <laughs> yes. Um, so here you have your review. So if you're going in to actually see the aggregate counts, you would select the review. That's where your superintendent will certify, where your special education director will certify. Um, all of those pieces will happen in the review phase. I'll get to that one in a, um, first. We'll take a look at that. Then you also have count summary details, just like all other reports. You have your, uh, your aggregate counts. That's under the review section here. And then you have your details report, which is going to go into those specific students who are making up those counts. Um, so the count summary details is going to go into detail about each individual student um, and how they're making up the counts that are you're seeing in the report. Then you have your error report, and you can review any errors of um, data that will be, um, you know, not counting towards EPS because of the way it's funded. That would be something you want to review to make sure that you're um, making sure that those errors are clean. This is a different type of error report than what you get in Synergy. Um, so that's running different validation. Check those over, make sure everything is clear um, and you should be all set there. Uh, special education count EFS 05 part one. We are doing a further deep dive into EFS 05 part one and part two on Thursday. Um, special education directors are encouraged to attend if you want to pass that along to your special education director. We will do, be doing a specific webinar for their reports that they need to certify. So that will give the details of students receiving special education services. Out of district placements, those are your students attending out of district. And then your attending student details or your attending student report is going to be your students who are attending your schools. So those will be um, only your students who are um, in seats at your school. This is the um, October report. So the report has two parts here. So you have the special education count EFS 05 part one as the top section. You will have uh, your super or your special education director will have a section where they will certify this report. Uh, and you'll see here the certified by and the certified date. Once they've done that work, um, you will see that all pop up here at the top. So they're just looking at the counts by disability type, and then they will certify the report. Once that is done, your superintendent can come in. They can review the counts of attending, subsidy, um, equivalent instruction, counts economic status, and then your grade level code, your SPUD, and then your pre-K or your grade level codes here. 
So they will just review that. Down here at the bottom, there is a difference between last year to this year. So you'll be able to see kind of how things have changed from last year to this current school year. Um, so you'll just want to review those changes so you can kind of know what's coming for your funding allocation there. So part one is certified by special education director, part two certified by your superintendent, and you'll see all of this certified information down here at the bottom. Once it's submitted, we go through a, an acceptance process where we check in your report and accept it, making sure everything looks good. Uh, we may contact you about you know, if your economic status counts look off uh, by a significant amount, we might contact you and say, is this truly accurate? Um, so we are running some checks there as well. So please make sure that everything is as accurate as possible. We want to make sure you get the funding that you're supposed to get as well. Um, so we will uh, run some validations for you too. But you should be checking as regularly as possible, making sure everything is correct, running this by other people as well. Um, so part one, and part two are listed here. We get a lot of calls from like superintendents and things saying they can't certify their report. And a lot of times it's because the special education director has not done their section yet. So just be aware of that. That may be important things to talk about as you prepare for this report to open next week. The count summary detail report, this is going to be all of your students who are in, uh, included in the counts for your reports. Um, so you can search this for specific students. You can save and export this report. Um, as again, we would like to point out, if you export this report, it will not upload. So if you update something in Synergy, you won't see it on your exported file. It will only upload in Neo, update in Neo. So just be aware of that too. Um, if you're sending this off to other, um, other staff to validate the data, you may not, uh, they will not see updates if you've exported it and sent it to them. So you'll have to run a new report once data is updated. Then you hear uh, the specific one that you notice on this report for the count summary details report is the counts attending versus this counts sub, uh, subsidy. So this is uh, based on those fiscal responsibility codes. It's telling you whether or not you're getting a uh, attending count for the student versus if you're getting a subsidy count for the student. Um, so if you're if you have an attending student who's a resident of the SAU, they live in the town, you're getting direct subsidy, they're attending your school, you're going to get the attending count and you'll get the subsidy count. Uh, for the second instance that you see here, this student has an attending count but a no subsidy count. That could be a student who is um, an out of district placement. Uh, so they're attending in your district, but they are an out of district for another district, that SAU would receive the funding. And then you would work out how you would be billed for that uh, or how you would bill for that so that you can fund for that student's attendance. Uh, so those are some of the instances there. The next example, the third option down here is kind of the opposite of that, where the student is not attending the SAU, but they're attending another SAU, but you're receiving the funding. So if you're receiving the funding, you would be billed then for that student potentially from the other SAU and you would work that out there. So this is just going to give you those raw counts of um, each student, whether they're counting for attending or and or for subsidy. So that information can be found here on this count summary detail. Then you have the error report. This is just something you want to go in, make sure that you're looking. You'll get the attending school, you'll get student ID, and then it will give you the error message for what you should be reviewing. So you'll want to go through and just make sure that the data is all correct um, and update anything there uh, for subsidy purposes. Before you certify, um, errors have to be cleared as well. So you'll want to make sure that you'll, you're taking care of these. There are some, I think the first tier, correct me if I'm wrong, tier one, they do have to fix and tier two, they don't have to fix. Mike, help me out on that one. I'm, I think I'm mixing them up. Uh, it's actually more of a Drew question. I think he was working okay. closely on that one. Drew. The validation logic has been rearranged. So anything that is a tier one issue, and that would be fiscal codes, enrollment discrepancies, um, those will stop you from certifying. Tier two issues will be warnings, which will be things like, you know, student is not eligible for subsidy. Those are just more of a, more of notifications 
um, things of that nature. So tier one so will things stop to so review. Nice here. Yeah. Yeah. So tier one is more of a validation, making sure the data are accurate. Um, and then tier uh, two is more looking at it and making sure like you're aware that the way that the student is coded will not get you funding um, or whatever the error may be. And you should review that, but you may not need to fix it if it's accurate. Uh, these are just some of the errors that you get. Um, there's no need to really dive into them too deeply. 100% um, state and federally funded, don't count for subsidy. That would just be something that you would want to be aware of, that they're funded differently there. Um, paid by resident SAU or EUT, invalid for resident student. That's a fiscal responsibility code, uh, not reconciling. So that's just some things. Some of these things you'll just want to go through and just make sure that you're taking a look at them. Um, I don't remember if we have this anywhere, um, but this will be available on this recording, uh, which I think Mike posted in the chat, the playlist that this will be posted on. Um, so please feel free to like pause it at this one and take a look. Special Education Child Count EFS 05. Um, oh, I'm missing this there. Um, part one. So this is the detail report for special education students. So you will see your students in attending district, their attending school, their resident district, their name, and then their age, their special education setting, ex exceptionality. All of that information will be listed out here. If things look incorrect on that first section of the uh, report that needs to be certified by the special education director, this is where they would go to make sure that those counts are accurate and that all the students are in there. The out of district placement report looks very similar. This is just gonna go through your students who are marked by another SAU as attending their SAU, but are, you are technically the responsible. Uh, so here you have like, the student is attending out of district and you would see their fiscal responsibility code, I believe, yep, right here. Um, and then you would see um, all of the information that you need to know about how this student is enrolled. Uh, as the responsible SAU, you would see those students here. And this would also include those students who are subsidy counts, but a zero for attending count. And then your attending student details. This is going to go through your students who are attending in your SAU and are marked um, as resident or paid by resident SAU, all of those fiscal responsibilities that you have actual, these bodies are in your seats. These are your students um, that are in the building every day, attending counts for your students here. These would be your attending count. Highly recommend doing as much validation as you can. Again, that 10-1 to 10-15 timeframe is not a timeframe where you can certify the report, but that it's running so that you can do some review of the data and make sure that the data are all accurate. I would highly recommend kind of pulling some of this data, pulling your uh, count summary, your attending, your out of district placement reports, and sending it off to those subject matter experts. Remember, data is a team sport. So send that information out to your subject matter experts and ask them for their feedback to make sure that all the data are complete. And um, that way you can get it uh, certified on time with the most accuracy as possible. And then if you have questions, please feel free to contact medms.support at main.gov, medms.support at main.gov, um, or visit our website. I uh, highly recommend bookmarking that. It's going to be really helpful during this October timeframe. I do want to remind everyone that there are quite a few reports that are coming due very soon. Um, quarter one is due on the 15th, which is attendance, truancy, bullying, and uh, behavior reporting, um, dropout reporting, which is also based on 10-1, is due on the 15th as well. So you will want to, there are quite a few reports on top of this one, and then not to mention the staff reports that are due. Um, so we are going to be experiencing higher call volumes, which will slow down things in terms of getting back to you. Um, it may not be as quick as we've been all summer uh, because we just have more volume that we have to get through before we can get to your um, email or your call. So please be aware of that. If you do submit an email and then decide to give us a call, 
let the person know that you're that you're talking to on the phone that you submitted an email and it might expedite your ticket your call experience so they can have that id number or whatever it may be there uh, ready to go and available on that note also i will put this little plug in there for uh, student data security please make sure that you're sending state student id numbers to us we don't need student names to find these students in synergy we only need their state student ID numbers and it will protect student information to have only that ID number being put into that correspondence in an email. So please, 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 please use the student ID number when you're communicating about a student who is um, has an enrollment issue or some sort of issue in Synergy you're experiencing. Uh, we really just need that ID and we'll be all set. Any other questions before we wrap up today? No problem, Cindy. All right, it sounds like we are ready to roll. Um, October 1st is a week away. And so we're getting there and we are here to support you through all of the reporting. Uh, we're happy to help. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We want to make sure that you get the funding that you need uh, to educate these students in Maine. So please, please don't hesitate to reach out and get what you need. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.